only talking cat I thought that really pulled it off was Puss in Boots and Shrek. Now, mm-hmm. Other than that, I don't I don't want to see a cat talking to me. It, it kind of freaked me out. Actually, there's a writer, uh, Rita Mae Brown. She has her cat helps her sleuth. Um, Sneaky Pie Brown is actually the assistant sleuth. Yeah, right? I'm not, I'm not reading that. And it's actually pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, not going to happen. No. Yeah. Our guest in this <laughs> segment, I don't know, maybe she has cats. I don't know. It's funny. And she goes great. Um, uh, Rita Mae does a really good speech. By the way, in about uh, 20 minutes, the uh, Doug Widmeyer Memorial Charity Golf Classic tees off to benefit or registers to benefit Habitat for Humanity, the Eastern Panhandle. Tea time's 10, so you still have time to get there. If you'd like to just kind of walk up and play today, it's $125 per person, and the proceeds benefit Habitat for Humanity in the uh, name of Doug Widmeyer, a great guy. He was a great guy, yeah. Yeah. as is his son. So. Indeed. Yeah. Our guest in this segment is Senator Patricia Rucker. Senator Rucker, good morning. Good morning, and yes, to answer your question, I do have two cats. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. They're not called Sneaky Pie, though, are they? What, what did you name them? No. Uh, one is Neela, and the other is Skittles. Would Those they, are good cat names. Would they, could, if you ever decide to write novels, as John does, would you incorporate your cats into your novels? And what role so would they play? It's really funny that you asked that question, because <laughs> my daughter, Teresa, who is my youngest, she has a book that she's writing that is uh, called A Cat Visiting the Capitol. And that's because she did bring Skittles to visit the Capitol, and she's trying to turn it into a children's book. I think, like, if you have a cat, Skittles, I think it's a law. And you could verify this for me, Senator Rucker, because you're surrounded by laws there in Charleston. It, it, I think it's a law that the name Skittles has to be considered as one of the three names to name your cat. I don't know about that. I know like 50 cats named Skittles. Well, if you recall, the the Clintons had a cat named Sox. Right. And Sox wrote one of the best-selling books of the year when it came out in whenever he was president a number of years ago. So, but Sox, if Sox the Cats can write a book, I think Skittles can write a book too. Skittles. And what's the other one's name? Her name, uh, the other one's Neela. Neela. Where does Neela, where does Neela come from? So she actually was abandoned on our porch and never left. And we eventually adopted her and took care of her. But she's a beautiful calico cat. And mm-hmm. my daughter chose the name Neela, and I have no idea why. That's but cool. It fits her. Yeah, my, we, were, we were a dog family for the longest time. And then in the late 70s, there were some seriously bad winters. And my mother, we were at the time petless, and my mother looked out back and underneath an evergreen she saw a cat and it was just you know brutal weather during the winter at that time and she rescues the cat and it uh, turns out it's uh, there's another one with that cat two kittens right and then those those kittens as it turns out one was a boy and one was a girl so we ended up with a third cat about a year later and then we became a cat family at that point we were a dog family up to that point Taking yeah, a, we got dogs too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You said there was a resignation there. T- taking a break from cats for just a second. Karen Dunn's taking a break from her duties at the East West Foundation Community Foundation to address who Anthony Bouchard was. Boucher. Boucher, a distinguished mystery fiction critic, editor, and author. And the event you're going to is the world's premier event bringing together all parts of the mystery and crime fiction community. So. Bill, not only did you mess up the name of the convention <laughs> guy, but you, but you messed up the name of the, of the organization, too. Well, East West Eastern West Virginia, Virginia Community Foundation. Foundation. I add the community, but it's tail end. <laughs> Thank I, you, Karen. I, I, <laughs> all right. So, uh, Senator Rucker, let's uh, let's get saved by you before this show goes. <laughs> you should have heard the pregame discussion. No, you should not, <laughs> have Patricia. You're lucky coming in when you did. Uh, you are in Charleston for the interims, I presume, correct? Yes, I am. Okay. I'm literally walking in the parking lot about to go in the building. And you have a you have a big meeting at nine o'clock this morning, correct? Yes, and I actually, um, not your fault, but I ended up scheduling one at 7.30 a.m., which is why I was a couple minutes late, so I apologize for that. It's okay. Yeah. Uh, what is your meeting at 9? Okay. <laughs> so I have to stop and think. Hold is, on. Is that Judiciary? Um, yes, Judiciary Interim Committee. Okay. So uh, during the course of the 60-day session, Judiciary flushes out the, the bills, basically, to, 
to de- to determine what the legality of them, the practicality of them? Is that what judiciary does? Not always. Judiciary also in interim sessions, we sometimes have presentations about a problem or issue that someone has, you know, wants to educate us on something, you know, I mean, it could be just about anything. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I think child welfare continues to be kind of, you know, very much um, high on the priority list for a, a lot of the judiciary meetings. But um, sometimes it's some pressing, you know, complication that we, you know, get told about that we may need to find some law to fix. Mm-hmm. So it, it could really just be about anything. Um, I will confess to you that I have not looked at the agenda for today, but um, that's okay. we have an interim meeting almost every single month between now and when the session begins. So we have one now, September, October, November, and December scheduled. So okay. a lot, a lot of meetings coming up. I want to get your opinion on the state providing funding for child care because that's become an issue since the governor sort of opened it up. I believe it was in a state of the state speech last winter. And it's gone back and forth as to whether or not you believe that the state should be paying for child care or at least assisting some of the costs for child care. I've heard both sides of this argument. I just want to make sure that folks know and understand what we're talking about. We're not talking about paying child care for every citizen in the state, we're talking about low income. So we already currently provide uh, subsidies for child care for low income and um, individuals. Of course, you know, those folks have, we're trying to give them a hand up so that they can become independent. Um, When they have children, that's obviously a difficulty like it is for anyone, but especially, you know, the single moms, single dads, and folks who are just, you know, getting paid $20 an hour. So there's a subsidy for that. What happened during COVID is we added uh, first responders to being eligible for the subsidy, and we did um, slightly expand those subsidies. And now that is ending because the COVID emergency has ended, but those folks are really wanting us to make it permanent. So that's really what this is about. And yes, there's a lot of discussions. I think one of the biggest difficulties I have myself personally, like I said, I've been part of a lot of these meetings where we've had presentations from different folks from different sides. The problems and issues we have with childcare, it's not going to be fixed by just a subsidy or just by some temporary expansion. We don't have enough childcare facilities in the state. It is, um, there's a lot more need than there is um, those providing. And it's very difficult for those providers to keep staff um, for, you know, for their centers. And that's, I think, part of the reason we don't have enough. And so that's a problem that's not really going to be fixed by subsidies or, or, or temporary expansion. Um, I think one of the things I would like to tackle is to find out why it costs so much money. If we can, if it's regulation or something we can streamline. Um, Let's see if we can do that. And then also see what we could do about really creating incentives for facilities um, for, for folks to offer child care options. I think, as you can imagine, whenever you're dealing with children, everyone's priority is, of course, safety. And there are set rules in place, how many adults per child, you know, the things that must be um, part of that facility, part of the places where children will be. There's, it's a whole book of regulations. And so it's been, it's been a big thing to look into, but we have definitely started that. Senator, this is John Gilstrap. Uh, you know, I, I came from Fairfax a couple of years ago, and there, child care facilities, uh, for-profit child care facilities, kinder care, children's world, that sort of thing, grow like Dollar Trees grow here. Has there been any consideration toward incentivizing uh, 
entrepreneurs to open for-profit childcare facilities and 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 allowing those to flourish and absolutely that's exactly what i'm talking about is to try to encourage for-profit facilities we did a tax credit already for private businesses who want to have child care facility options for their employees and you know it could be just their employees or they could open it up to the public we did a tax credit for that um i can tell you i've heard from the business community that they feel it wasn't quite um, enough. They think that that need, needed to be more than what we proposed initially. Senator, the governor's proposal, uh, were they uh, conditions or were they boundaries uh, uh, attached to it? And if there were boundaries, what was the approximate dollar amount to, uh, to satisfy his proposal? I have not heard any dollar amounts. I know that one of the things that they have you know, put into the, the mix, I guess you'd say, is making permanent something that happened during COVID, which was that we pay based on the child and not based on attendance. So typically that subsidy that I was mentioning for low income when it comes to child care is based on attendance. And if the parents, you know, don't have the child coming in, we are not paying um, for that, you know, the facility for that child when they didn't show up. And that seems like it makes sense. But the problem is that those facilities have that child space allotted. If they allot that space for that child, and remember, again, this is the low-income qualifying folks, um, and that person doesn't come, they still have to have the teacher, the, the, you know, the staff, the food, whether or not that child shows up or not. So those facilities really, really, you know, want us to pay based on the slot and not the actual attendance. You, you use the because term, they have fixed costs. Yeah, using the term low income is there? Uh, is there's there, probably a better term. I'm yeah. sorry. I'm no, just, no, no, no. And, I, and I, it's it's what you're conveying what you uh, need to do. But are there is there a fixed means test or is there uh, uh, graduation or uh, various levels of the means test? How does that work? So um, there are graduations. And there's different things that are taken into account when determining um, whether you qualify. So number of children, uh, all income that's coming into, you know, that family. Um, all, there's like all sorts of criteria if there's, you know, medical issues, if there's transportation needs. And so they, they put in all of the data that they gather to determine whether or not you fit the criteria. I am. I'm certain that it never, ever is a perfect system. It, it's impossible to expect that it would be. Senator Patricia Rucker, our guest here on the program. Were you in Taiwan recently? Yes, I was. I just arrived back yesterday. Were you over there talking smack after they lost in the Little League World Series to us? Was that what that was about? <laughs> no, I did not bring that up. But it was a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to get to talk with government leaders all over Taiwan. We... Um, had an hour-long meeting with the vice president, who is actually a um, friend of mine back when she was an ambassador stationed in D.C., cool. got to know her. So that was really fun to get to see her. And then there were um, meetings with both Taipei city officials, the national officials, and then lots of different agencies of the Taiwanese government, you know, talking about our mutual interests. The Olympics. Um, so it was really a wonderful visit. I learned a lot. What uh, on the horizon? Are there any new business opportunities between West Virginia and Taiwan, Senator Rucker? Absolutely. And I don't know if folks know that West Virginia has a trade office that you know we opened in Taiwan. We have this wonderful guy there that it is you know his job to be trying to match businesses with, um, you know, and what they need with West Virginia and what it can provide. And we are definitely looking at more opportunities. There's already been one um, 
major investment of a company here in West Virginia, and now we're just looking for more. Who went with you on the delegation, uh, Senator? So this was a national delegation. So there was um, senators and representatives from five, six different states. So I had a friend from Maryland, Alabama, I'm trying to remember, Arizona, Wyoming, um, Rhode Island, (laughs) um, and Utah. And it was really fun. Senator Patricia Rucker, our guest here on the program, as uh, you wind down this uh, political year and a new one starts with a new governor and and presumably uh, um, the potential for new leadership in the House, although uh, Roger Hanshaw stated that he would like to be uh, continue on as speaker, there will be a need for a new Senate president. Uh, Are you interested in in being Senate president, uh, Patricia, once again? You had obviously made a move for that previously. Um, I, I'm always interested in serving in any way that I can, the great folks of my district and of the state, um, in terms of how exactly, you know, it, I'm very open to whatever is best. I will tell you that, you know, if we have really good Senate president candidate that I can support and back, I would be very glad to support and back that person. I know that there's a lot of behind-the-scenes wrangling going on for who will support who and whatever. Are there any people that are right now uh, in the forefront uh, for Senate President? So there's about, you know, four names being floated around and I think actively pursuing the Senate presidency. But I don't want to really give out names because it can change. It can change in a week. It can change in a day. Mm -hmm. It's constantly a revolving process. And, you know, really, I think it's premature we don't know who's going to win. And my focus right now is winning re-election. Yeah. But also, Charles Trump was not going to be returning as a judicial chair. Uh, any thoughts about who may take his place? I, I don't know. It's obviously the governor's prerogative. I will tell you that, you know, I'm going to miss Charles greatly. He was a good friend and an excellent statesman. His voice is definitely will be missed. But I know he will do wonderful things on the Supreme Court. If you if you are not the next Senate president, is there a particular committee that you would really want to chair? <laughs> um, well, I will tell you um, that I, I actually care very, very deeply about several committees. I have been in judiciary and health the entire time I've been a senator. I care deeply about those committees. I also care always about education. And um, although we have a great education chair currently right now and happy to support the work she's doing. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see. Are you surprised at this interim session that it is not also a special session, Patricia, and, and that you're not discussing a greater tax cut than 4%? Uh, I, I was surprised and very grateful because once again, um, we were having – you know, a call for a special session that we thought was happening, but we had seen no bills. And I can tell you, I'm very much, um, I just think that's wrong. If we're, if we're going to have a uh, special session, you want us to consider legislation, we should see those bills way ahead of time, have opportunity to look at them, study them, share them with constituents, get their input on it. I don't like the last minute throwing bills um, that we have two hours to look at, that's, that's not acceptable. And I don't think that's a good way of doing government. Is that happening? Are you getting bills? It, has, abs- it has absolutely happened. This um, time? Multiple th- times. Not this time. Th- like okay. I said, he did end up, yeah. you know, postponing this special session. But we were, as of last week, still had no bills. Nothing to know what we were going to be dealing with. So I was glad that he postponed it, but... I don't know what to tell you. Um, there's been too many of those special sessions where we see the legislation just a few hours before we're supposed to vote on it. Senator, I want to change course here for uh, the last couple minutes. You and uh, John Doyle have a debate coming up in the uh, October 1st. Is that the first one? I think. Yeah. Okay. So you're changing the paradigm of debates. No moderator. And uh, how did give us a peek behind the scenes of how that evolved to change the way debates are done. Well, I mean, I will tell you that um, John and I have a good relationship. We talk often and frequently about lots of things, you know, regarding the issues. And 
West Virginia and our district. John, you know, he's one of my most active constituents who contacts me a lot to let me know about things that, you know, I, I should be aware of and should um, his opinion of what I should do and <laughs> things like that. And anyways, when we ended up being um, opponents, I can tell you it never became unfriendly or anything like that. He respects me and I respect him. And he actually called me the night of the primary um, to suggest that we organize our own debate. And I told him, okay, be happy to talk to you about this. Like, in a few weeks, it's too soon right now, but we we ended up talking and discussing, and both him and I are very um, similar in that we really stand by our convictions. We you know have our ideas, our principles that guide us. Um, have no problems defending our positions, and we just feel that unfortunately, the forum process that we you know, usually get invited to participate in does not give us the opportunity to really explain our positions on issues. It's, it's more the typical forms. It's like they want sound bites. They want you know, a quick answer to something that is usually much more complicated to answer than just one minute. So we came together with this idea of creating this type of debate, and I think it will be really, really fascinating for the folks who come to listen and participate. Patricia, thank you so much for your time this morning. Very much appreciated. Of course. You guys have a great day. Thanks, Senator. Senator Bye -bye. Patricia Rucker, owner of Two Cats, uh, by the way.